My name is Philip Martin. I'm the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery here in Los Angeles. It's a beautiful day here in Southern California, and I'm really delighted that everyone could join us here today. There's quite a few people coming in nice from all over the place, so that's really fantastic. One of the things about our Basel that we really enjoy is the ability to talk to people across the world, uh, be they in Europe, Africa, Asia, um, and of course here in the United States. So um, again, my name is Philip Martin. I'm the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery with my wife, uh, Portia Hine. You might've met her at the fairs or at the gallery. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is a conversation that I've been very much looking forward to. Um, we, I went to the University of Texas, proud alum, and I'm really delighted that by happenstance, all these aspects of my life have come together uh, in that Cedric Huckabee, who I work with, who is going to have a show here at the Blanton Museum of Art, opening in May. Um, his show is going to happen at the same time with Kwame Brathwaite, whose uh, uh, work I also represent, and we're joined here today by his son, Kwame Samari Brathwaite. Uh, Kwame and Cedric are in conversation with uh, Carter Foster, the Deputy Director for Curatorial Affairs and Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Blanton Museum at the University of Texas, and um, Claire Howard, the Assistant Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the museum. So we're going to look at some works today, learn about what people are working on and what they're doing. If you have questions, you should put them in the Q&A. And um, I will mute my mic here and, and let people kind of uh, get started. So, um... hi everyone. We ready? Should I start? Without further ado, let's start with Cedric and uh, and Carter. Uh, so thanks so much. Um, I just want to say how thrilled we are to be hosting both of these um, exhibitions at the Blanton um, that, that do overlap. Cedric's show opens. May 29th, uh, 2021, um, and the Brad, uh, Kwame Brathwaite Black is Beautiful opens June 27th, 2021. So they have quite a bit of overlap. Um, and since we don't have a lot of time, I'll get right to it with some questions for Cedric. Um, Cedric, I first saw your work about 15 years ago in one of um, Thelma Golden's amazing shows at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And it was a very large quilt painting. And I was so struck by, um, first of all, the virtuosity with oil paint that you have, and also, um, it was, it was like it was a commentary on, on, on abstraction in a way without being abstract. So I know that quilts have played a significant role as a subject in your work. I wonder if you could just talk about them to start with um, and, and why they interest you. Well, I grew up with quilts. Uh, we grew up with quilts in my family all around us. My grandmother was a quilter. And um, growing up, when I started painting early on, I used to put them in the, as, in the background of paintings. But as I um, grew older, I learned uh, more about the quilting tradition and the quilts became a prominent part of my painting. They sort of moved from the background to become the subject of the paintings. And they were like, it was like doing a, um, um, it was like collaborating with her on, on work or commenting on, the, uh, on her work as an artist. Um, and I know that you've, and we've talked about what, what might be in your show at the Blanton, it's gonna be recent work, but um, you've been combining quilt, depictions of quilts with portraits as in this work that we're looking at now. Um, I wonder if you could talk about that, that a little bit. Um, so for a while, as I just said, the, the, the works, the quilts were in the background and then they became the subject. Um, but that, even though quilts were the subject of some paintings, I was still a, figure, a figurative painter and I would paint people and do different types of portraiture. And this is sort of a reuniting of the quilts and the portraits again, but the quilt now um, takes, it takes on the role as a, a, as a kind of um, uh, object that uh, encapsulates uh, our legacy and a kind of cultural heritage um, along with it. So it's an expressive um, African-American, um, object that that uh, I own and that many people um, um, own and it, it, it so that is um, paired together with some of the uh, the the figures or the people that I'm painting to to create a, a, a sort of new whole 
Are, are they always quilts that you own or that are in your family or do you, do you make them up sometimes? Like, um, they started as just my grandmother's quilts. And then um, as I went along, I started uh, painting other people's quilts. And so it's, it's grown over time from, from uh, just a personal object uh, that I own to, to the quilts of others. So they're always a real quilt in the world. There, there's some, something that somebody owns or, or has, has lived with and used. Yes, for the most part they are. Right. Um, and so I know that you also you find it very meaningful to work with live models. Sometimes they're people that you are very close to, your family, and sometimes they're people that you know. Um, but I wonder if you could just talk about that process and what's different about painting a person who's in front of you in the flesh versus, you know, doing, doing it in some other way. There's many ways to do portraits, obviously. There, there is. Uh -oh. And um, I'm most excited about painting from life. Um, I don't always paint from life, and, and this COVID is, is a real challenge when it comes to that. I'm sure. Um, but uh, I'm most excited about that because uh, a person brings with them a certain kind of energy. Um, and that energy, um, it's, it's almost like a, a collaboration with the person when they're there um, because their energy feeds you and it's no longer uh, trying to depict a, mom a moment in time or trying to capture a moment in time. It's about a compilation of moments that build up to a, a sort of end result. And hopefully that end result is one that feels very living um, or that has a lot of movement and that has a sense of uh, an, something built up over time, a presence over time. I think one of the incredible things about oil paint is for whatever reason, and you can explain it better than I can, I'm sure, but it, it, you can get the sense of a sitter and someone's, I mean, you can look at a, at a painting from the 17th century and, and just have a sense of psychology and the person is like they're still alive. And I think that's, I, there's something about oil paint that allows that subjectivity of the person to get in there. I, I, and I think you see it in the portrait, like this is an incredible painting. Maybe you could talk about this painting a little bit. Um, well, it's, it, there's always this back and forth, you know. Um, uh, on the one hand, you're just responding to what you see, um, just like anything else. And then on the other hand, the thinker is there, like you're looking at this person, you're trying to capture a certain sense of likeness, um, and you're thinking about the piece that you're creating, you know, um, what, what does it mean and what is being um, spoken of when you create that painting. And so uh, in some senses, some things are very fluid. They happen in the moment and um, at that moment or at that time. And then in another sense, you've thought about this thing and, and, and um, you step back and sort of, you know, it's, it's plotted and planned. And that's what you're, you're seeing there is a, is, a, um, is a compilation of those things. You see uh, at the moment expression of that shirt or that hand or that face. And then you see the, the thoughtfulness of this person placed in front of this quilt with this light situation. Do you, um, do you paint the, the, your sitters as they um, come to you? Like, do you tell them what to wear or anything like that or because I know that especially in some of these recent works the t-shirts and the mess the messaging on the t-shirts has been a an important part of the work yeah we um this uh our, most of this new work has has the subject of the t-shirt which deals are the t-shirts are memorial t-shirts and they're usually weren't worn to the funeral or to the wake um and it deals with the subject of death and that's the subject that I've been dwelling into um, recently um, is the subject of, of uh, black mortality. Um, I know you, um, you spent, well, let's talk about the sculpture because the sculpture seems to be a, a somewhat new direction for you. Am I correct? I don't know that you've been doing sculpture as long as you've been painting and drawing. Um, so I've done sculptures for a long time, but they've all, always been a back burner kind of thing. Um, if you would have seen sculpture uh, in past shows, it would have looked like a sort of odd thing. You'd see it, but mostly there was paintings and people thought of me as mostly as a painter. Um, but what I hope with some of the new sculptures is that, um, you know, you can see that even though, you know, I love painting, 
but um, sculpture can be a, uh, a primary part of, of, of the language that I use in art, not just as a, like a background thing, but a primary thing. What's so striking about these sculptures, and I, I had the pleasure of visiting you not too long ago in your, um, one of your studios to see some of these in person. And, and this is a good photograph, but it doesn't really convey the tactility of the surface, the fact that they, I mean, they really do have this great rapport with your paintings, which are so textural and use such um, great, you know, take advantage of what oil paint can do with impasto and, and, and you know, painterliness. And the sculptures have that feel too because of this, Paper mache technique, right? That you um, that you've. I think you you told me someone taught you fairly recently, or you learned about it. Uh, yeah, it was uh, Dr. Eddie McAnthony is where I learned this technique from. And oh, that's and a great Mc picture. Was a student of John Biggers, and um, he didn't learn this technique from John Biggers. He actually created this technique of of. Uh, paper mache, where the whole sculpture is all um, paper, uh, newspaper. But um, he did, what he did get from John and from that whole school is a sense of, a strong sense of, of uh, craftsmanship. He, he always teaches, you know, to have this, this, this um, solid sense of craftsmanship in your work. And, uh, and I really appreciate that as a kind of you know, I feel like he handed this thing down to me, um, and 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 that's a wonderful feeling to have. It's also the, the way you're combining it with painting is is so interesting, and and just makes like a a, a totally different genre, um, almost. I feel like. You know, it feels really good because for a number of years, I, I've I've always done a number of things, and they've seemed disconnected. You know, um, and with this work you see drawing, painting, and sculpture all sort of harmonizing together and not feeling disconnected, but sort of unified. And, and, and that's what feels good is that um, it can all be done. They are pretty different, but they, they belong in the, in the context that, I, that we're showing them, they belong together. Uh, well, and you've, all, you've, you've always thought of your work, um, at least in, you've, you've created environments for your work. You've done, you've done installations in buildings and things like that. So it sort of fits with that. Um, you also recently made a very striking film that that basically shows you making a drawing, um, and um, and it's uh, I was that was really interesting too because that seemed like a sort of a new direction. I, was that the first film you've made? Uh, yes, it was. Um, yeah. My my son actually recorded the, the recording of that uh, for me, and um, it it was a memorial that that we were making for uh, the um, the person. The one person they have in Tarrant County, which is the area that I live in, um, uh, that is um, on the records as being lynched in our area, which is Fred Rouse. Wow. And so the, the video was a video about um, Fred Rouse and a Crazy. drawing that I was doing about that, but not of Fred, but just sort of about the subject. Mm. Um, well, I want to um, give, Kwame and Claire time to talk. I think we're, um, but thank you so much, Cedric. It's such a pleasure to see you always. And um, we are so excited about your show. Um, thank you. Great. Um, and I'll reiterate, yeah, that, that Kwame, we're, we're very excited to be having um, your father's show, Traveling to the Blanton, um, organized by Aperture in New York. And I thought we could start out our conversation by talking a little bit about your work specifically with your father's archive and, and new images that you've discovered there, like the one we're looking at right now of um, Clara Lewis Bugs with this yellow flower. Yeah, um, thank you for um, taking the time and thanks for the opportunity um, for Philip and the Blanton and everyone. But I, and, and I have to say um, the work uh, that Cedric is doing is, is quite stunning and, and I've been quite taken aback by it. So I'm looking forward to um, giving us a chance to spend some time with it as well. Uh, you know, for me, it was really a, a, a matter of looking at my father's work and, and taking kind of responsibility for making sure that it was preserved. And so this work, the, this new work has been quite uh, amazing. It's, it's really amazing to work with the archive and, and constantly discover new things that are uh, coming to us. This is Clara Lewis Bugs, who is one of the 
uh, first uh, eight Grand Dassa models. Uh, and we found this portrait work, which again, you know, when we look at when this was, this is around 1962, you're looking at work that is, um, you know, medium format uh, that is capturing uh, black beauty, um, the black is beautiful movement, which was, you know, the A jazz, African jazz art society and studios, uh, my, a group that my father and my uncle um, uh, co-founded, but it was this, this notion of creating this um, canon for people to understand what um, what black beauty is and, and how to embrace it. And I think it's really interesting hearing Cedric talk about the work and how, you know, working with this kind of portraiture or working with uh, kind of this, the, the canvas, but also the model and, and, you know, the jewelry and the hair and, and all these things take a part, uh, take a, take part in creating this image and, 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 and speaking and him being able to speak through uh, the work that he's pr pr producing. Yeah, and, and this is another great um, new image that, that you've discovered of Miles Davis working out um, and the access that your father had to major figures in the jazz scene and his own work in that scene and kind of bringing the jazz scene back uptown um, was really a significant part of his mission, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because actually Miles Davis was one of the first um, um, uh, primary financiers for um, a jazz. He was in great support of the group. He he loved what they were doing, and you know he was um, he actually helped you know put put shows together. He participated when when possible, and you know they, he did have this access. And it was one of the major things that uh, enabled them to move about in the world um, from you know from their political ideas to you know his access to capturing these moments and these significant moments in, in history. Um, but it was also fueled by, you know, the foundation of and the core of the Black is Beautiful movement, embracing our ancestry, embracing, you know, our culture, um, our connection back to Africa, but also, um, you know, some of the primary functions of Garveyism, which is, you know, in, in this in this particular uh, image, it's by Black. And this is uh, uh, Charles Peeker standing on one of the famous uh, points on 125th Street where oftentimes street speakers would, you know, participate in, and speak to the community and educate people on what was going on. Um, so this is, you know, he was known as Charles Speaker, street speaker, um, but this is a ladder that actually uh, reoccurs in, in, in much of the work, but also it's the ladder that, you know, Malcolm X would speak on so oftentimes. And um, it, it's a really interesting, um, kind of re-engagement as you look at where we are now today you know this is in the 60s and you know this kind of resurfacing about buying black and focusing on creating community uh, supporting the community um, and it's it's being recurrent in kind of even the movement that's happening now in the black lives matter movement and um, people focusing in there's been a call to a lot of you know major corporations to 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 employ and um, support black businesses, but also um, for the community to kind of support itself. Yeah, the role of, of creativity and community and its alliance with activism in your father's work is something that I find really compelling and, and as you point out, really relevant, um, especially in light of summer's uprisings. Um, and, you know, even uh, these really beautiful fashion images that your father created have um, have a real purpose to them. So this is a beautiful photograph. It's the cover of the catalog and it's your mother, correct, Sapolo? Yeah, um, yes. Being the participant, so welcome. Thank you for <laughs> my best. Um, we're really honored. Um, and, you know, I think uh, we can talk to you about the headdress that she's wearing, which was designed by um, Carolee Prince um, and the importance of kind of the African vernacular, embracing a variety of skin tones, um, as well as kind of working against European beauty standards and, and the Grand Asa models, um, the fashions that they produce and their photographs of their father. Yeah, you know, I, I thought it was important, you know, at the, you know, the, the core of the Black is Beautiful Moon is really, you know, embracing uh, culture, but also embracing who you are, right? That, that ancestry and, and the connection back to Africa, as I said before. But I think it's really important that people understand that that in doing so, you know, with the beautiful work that Carolee Prince was doing, the work that 
um, a number of grand Edison models like Nims of Brath, my, my aunt, um, as well as others in the, in the group, they were, they were being self-sufficient. It was this notion that you can, one, you don't have to fall into the fashion trends that were happening, you know, downtown, you know, we had a community of creatives. We had a community of um, people who were able to create for themselves and for others. And it created this self-sufficiency within the community, you know, black, buying black, keeping dollars in the community, recycling, and making sure that you have and maintain wealth, but also at the core of it, really, as you said, embracing a standard of beauty that was for you um, and not accepting someone else's um, thoughts about what you should be doing. And so it was a really important thing. And, and, and also, as you, you talk about the political, you know, um, there is this connection back to um, numerous African nations um, where, you know, AJAS and of, through the Grand Asset models and, and, and this kind of global kind of reach, were able to one, make the connections and influence and, and make sure that their influence both here in the States and back in, in, in nations like Namibia, Mozambique and, you know, Ghana and, and around the world, um, there was a, um, there was an active role in moving the culture forward. It wasn't just about, um, you know, the beauty part. It was, it wasn't just about the fashion and the, and the, and the celebrity. It was about creating uh, a system where we as a people can understand who we are, be educated and, 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 and move forward. Yeah, I mean, when you think about the, the international context for the work that your father was doing, this was a major moment of decolonization in Africa. And so I think that, that the work he was doing in the United States really enters into this important dialogue about self-determination um, and, and self-definition that I think is really kind of a fascinating um, lens through which to, to view this show, as well as kind of his commitment to showing, you know, as we see here, kind of everyday life, you know, the importance of placemaking and his, and his work is something I think is really strong. Um, so I think what's great about this show and what I'm so excited about um, working with it uh, on is, is kind of the variety of, of work that there's, you know, there's jazz images, there's, um, images of, you know, Garvey Day parades, there's, you know, these kind of everyday life images, and there are these stunning fashion images, but there's this through line of creativity, activism, community, um, that I think unites all of them. I love this the picture of the African market. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, the previous image was Misha's Books, which was the place to be, the, the incredible bookstore. Um, it was really interesting in, in, in watching, we, we recently had uh, a small feature with age as the grand Miles and my father's work in, in a four part docu series that was called by whatever means necessary, where Misho's books was prominent and they talked about how that was the place and, and how, if you went there and you wanted to learn something, they would, they would loan you a book and, and because it was about educating the community. But I think it's really interesting, as you say, you know, there, there are all these different types of um, ways in which the work can connect and one of the things that I've, I'm doing, doing now is ensuring that we look at projects, collaborations, and things that that enable people to experience the work in different ways. And so, you know, for for us, one of the things that we're looking at, um, I'm working with a group of musicians, um, um, and we are working on a multimedia project. Um, Nicholas Payton, Marcus Gilmore, and uh, a friend um, that I've uh, made through through a Basel actually event and through a, a mutual friend, um, um, Brandon Baker, and we are working on putting together um, works and multimedia experiences. And one we did most recently was called We Will Breathe and kind of counteracting the narrative about not being able to breathe and, and what's happening now, but have putting kind of a positive spin on it and, and inspired by the photography. And so I think the things that we're doing, um, working with different companies and you know, the way that Rihanna um, and Fenty embraced the whole buy black and, and how that was actually before all of this was happening, but also then pulling this into um, the culture now and what's happening now. I think there's there's been a refocus on creatives, um, focusing in on the community and on what they're doing and how they can impact and influence, which I think was the core, which, you know, that connection with people like Muhammad Ali and Stevie Wonder and, and Nina Simone and others were 
back in the 60s. And so um, it, it really is a, a, a really amazing and fun project to work on. But it's also one that, that helps secure legacy, but also educates people. And, and, and another thing that we're working on is creating the 501c3, uh, the Kwame Brothwood Archive, to continue that education. And so finalizing that now. So it's really, it's really great to be able to have institutions like, your, like the Blanton be able to show the work and, and continue to work with Aperture to, to bring that, this show to different places. Is the, is the archive really large, Kwame? I'm just curious how. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite large. We've, we've had a great, um, you know, we've been scanning, you know, with the pandemic and not being able to kind of connect too much. We've, we've worked with, um, you know, our gallery as well as, you know, our, um, we work with a, a team, uh, Film Solutions, that we are working through helping scan the archive. And so we're taking negatives and we've been really making some great progress, but there's, you know, there's quite a bit more to do. And I think my goal is to, to really finish that up in this next year. And so that we can really do a deep, deep dive on on what the breadth of the catalog is. But they're, you know, they're in the tens of thousands of images. You know, he shot from wow. 1956 to probably around 2014, 2015, uh, with the latest commission being with the New Yorker, um, where he where he photographed Joan Petit Ferrer, who's another artist that Philip represents. Um, but it, it's it's really quite amazing. This particular image was um, was is incredible. We were calling it the goddess Marie Toussaint. She was one of the original eight models, um, and she. Um, it's just it was just amazing. This this one was at a was actually at Sundance uh, as part of the UTA house, um, and it was really it was the the impact seeing people really um, react to the work has been quite incredible. Um, so it's it's been it's been really fun and. You know, it's it's uh it's a, it's also incredible seeing how people are reacting to the work from you know people who are inspired by it because they've been looking back at you know kind of oftentimes when you're going through struggle you kind of look back and, and kind of wax nostalgic and I think this work has been inspiring for people. Um, it creates a different sense of imagery, right? Positive imagery, and so it's it's really incredible. I would certainly add to that that um, I think. Is my mic back yeah, on? Yeah, you're on. You're on. I, I would certainly add to that that I think for anyone who wants to watch the uh, by whatever means necessary documentary, it really is uh, special. And I think one of the things about it that's actually really enjoyable is Eunice Townsend, who's one of the Grand Asa uh, models, an artist activist. Um, she's just really a beautiful soul. You really get a good sense of her, and I think it's really exciting to realize. And it's very important to realize that. The people depicted here are real people, and that's something that Kwame, um, as a, as an artist, really worked on in terms of bringing out the humanity of the subjects and really creating that sense of connection across his art, which is certainly something that I think um, a sense of shared humanity and a and a sense of how we interact with with the past and uh, whether we're looking at Cedric's work in terms of the conversation with the ancestors or a conversation with um, people that have, that you know, are that you think about but are not with you, but of course they are. And and these different ways of flowing back and forth with shared humanity through art is an important feeling in both the works. I'm very much looking forward to the presentation of the plan. It's just so exciting that that is happening. We have a few minutes left. I don't know if there's questions that people- I don't see any questions. And or if there's thoughts that people maybe, Cedric, did you have anything else that you maybe wanted wanted to add here before we got 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 going? Um, I, I can't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. <laughs> do you, do you and Kwame have questions I, I, for each other? I, feel free to ask. <laughs> no, I just, I'm just stunned. I think the, the, um, the, the beauty in, in some of, uh, uh, those photographs is just awesome. I can't wait to see the, the, uh, the 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 Blanton exhibition when it comes. No, I know. <laughs> Same here. Like, I'm gonna I'm 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 camp out at the front door. <laughs> I, hope we, I hope I hope we can have a party in person when we all get vaccinated or whatever because it'd yeah. be nice. <laughs> well, I, mean, I just want to uh, thank Art Basel for hosting this conversation. I want to thank everyone that came to see it. We really appreciate your taking the time. One of the things that I think has been really enjoyable 
in this odd time um, has been interesting ways to connect with people again. And I really appreciate everyone coming around and taking a look. Of course, I am an art dealer. Everything's for sale. I live with things in my own home. I certainly encourage you to make that decision. And I uh, want to just say that our thoughts go out to everyone in this time during COVID and just really thinking about what people are experiencing now. Um, Claire Carter, thank you so much. Thanks to the Blanton, thanks for joining us. And um, Austin is always fun, but how much more fun is it gonna be with these two shows? It's exciting, so thank you very much. Thank you to Cedric and Kwame. Really appreciate your time and effort for us. It's, it's great, yeah. Thank you both, thank you. Thank for you. Thank you both.